I'm just already in screen share. Still a few people joining. Cool. Um, let's see. All right. Um, before I jump into talking about history of Mount Etna and terroir and stuff like that, um, I'll start, I'll, I'll lead in with my own like personal Mount Etna history. Um, I'll keep it short, but, uh, so back in, I don't know, actually, all right. So when my mother was younger, when she was a little girl, um, she went on a trip to Europe with her parents and they spent a while on Sicily. Uh, like not, I don't think, I don't know if they really, I don't know if they went up Mount Etna, but they spent a while in Tarmina, which is down on the coast right there and stuff like that. So um, she spent a while there and has very fond memories of, of Sicily. So I don't even know when, back in like 20... 15, she started talking about the idea of going back to Sicily along with my younger brother and I. Um, and so that, that sort of got me thinking and uh, I started looking at Sicily on a map and I was like, geez, Sicily isn't that big. It's only like a hundred miles across or something like that. And I was like, I could run across Sicily. I could totally like run around Sicily. And I started reading about Sicily more and got like got kind of interested. In it. And as I started reading about the history of Sicily, you know, and we covered, I covered a lot of that last week, the history of, um, you know, the Moors, the, the Greeks, the Romans, the Byzantines, uh, the Normans, the Spanish, the English, everybody that were that were there. Um, you know, as I learned more about the history of Mount Etna, I was like, wow or the history of Sicily, I was like, wow, Sicily is insane. Um, and it just made me want to go even more. And um, I had also started working with Frank Cornelison, Pasapisciaro, and Ariana Occhipinti. And they're, they're three of the greatest, you know, wine makers, wine producers uh, on Sicily. So all of those things, both like my my mother's experience on Sicily as a little girl and reading about the history of Sicily and, you know, as I then was working with these awesome winemakers uh, on Sicily. And that got me really interested. And then I, you know, was looking at it and thinking like, geez, Sicily isn't that big. Like I could, I could probably run around Sicily. Um, and I just felt like I hadn't done anything that was really crazy and like, like really sort of dangerous and pushed my limits in a in a while in a stretch of years and so I was like you know what I should just go and run around Sicily and um still was sort of you know it seemed like a, maybe a little too crazy and then I was looking at plane tickets one day and I found round trip tickets to Catania the city right by Mount Etna for like seven hundred dollars so I bought them and then I you know and then I was committed and I had to do it and uh so I basically didn't prepare at all. Um, I studied, I brushed up on my Italian and I told Frank Cornelison and Ariana Occupinti and Pasapisciaro, Andrea Franchetti, I told all of them that I was coming. Um, but other than that, I really didn't prepare. I actually, I just took what I could carry, what I could run with. So I had this little ultralight running backpack and I actually like went to the warehouse that the morning that I was leaving, packed wine orders, like worked in the warehouse and then I hopped on one of my delivery vans and had the delivery guy drive me over to the, to the Portland airport and just like dropped me off at the airport in my running clothes with this ultralight tiny little running backpack with one change of running clothes, got on a plane and then like, I don't know what it was, like 21 hours later, I got off the plane in Catania, Sicily and could see Mount Etna up there on the horizon and was like, great. I, I don't even need, I, my mother had given me a guidebook and a Rand McNally map of Sicily and I had given them away to people on the plane because they didn't even apply to where I was going. I wasn't driving a car or anything. So I just, I gave them away. 
I just got off the plane. I could see Mount Etna and I was like, cool, I'll just start running towards Mount Etna. So I did. Um, and I got hopelessly lost in all of the little, uh, you know, volcanic cones and volcanic ridges and stuff like that, that, uh, that surround the mountain. Um, so I got completely lost. I ran like 15 miles or something like that and ended up in like some weird like subdivision and finally went into, it was getting dark. Um, actually, no, before that I was running along this big, big, busy main street, like four lanes going one way, four lanes coming back, going the other way. And I'm just like running along, you know, like not that fast, like just cruising along. And uh, there were high rises on one side of me and an empty lot on the other side, like huge gravel empty lot with a bunch of like trailers and stuff like that in it. And um, I was sort of zoning out, just sort of like, this is crazy. I can't actually believe I'm in Sicily right now. And then I heard dark, I heard uh, barking and I looked over and there was this pack of like, uh, like grimy, you know, like, like all shapes and sizes of dogs, like boiling out of this empty lot, charging at me. Cause no one runs in Sicily. They certainly don't run on like busy industrial roads and stuff like that at rush hour. So I look over and there's this pack of snarling, like mangy dogs charging at me, but they're on the other side of like all the lanes of traffic. And so I was like, but it was rush hour. And so traffic was virtually stopped, but I was like, oh, there's dogs. I'm in Sicily, I'm running, I'm lost. I'm running across Sicily and there's dogs. I have no idea where I'm going. I don't have like, I didn't have like a reservation in a hotel or anything. Um, but so I was just like, all right, got to get away from these dogs. And like, you know, started running fast. And uh, there was like one really aggressive, big, you know, dog that was really trying to get me. And I, you know, was staying ahead of him. And I ran around the car, a car from him. And this car was driving like maybe like two or three miles an hour. It was just like creeping along. And I got on one side of the car from this dog and started running back and forth around the car as the car was slowly, slowly moving. I just kept the car between myself and this dog. And, you know, it was like making eye contact with the, the Italian driver in the car. He was just looking at me like, what the fuck are you doing? What is happening here? Um, I don't know if he could even see the dog. He, maybe he just thought I was running back and forth around his car while he was stuck in traffic. Um, but slowly the car got further away from the empty lot over there. And then eventually I got far enough away with all the dogs, you know, like we were far enough from their, their territory and their trailers and stuff that they all sort of like gave up and turned around and went back. But that was what made it really real to me. I was like, okay, I'm really on Sicily and there's really dogs everywhere. Uh, I'm just gonna constantly have to watch out for dogs. Um, this picture here. So I, I finally went into a, like a bar, got an espresso and then explained to the people there what I was doing and it was getting dark. And I was like, can you just like call me a cab that can take me to a hotel or something like that? So, so then I got myself to a hotel and passed out. And, um, then the next morning got up and continued running towards Mount Etna. And so this was, this is a picture of that next morning when I woke up and started running and, got up on top of like a little, so you can see like right over here is a volcanic cone. Here's like a little cone and like, you know, we're pretty far away from Mount Etna here in this picture. I don't know, like 20 miles or something like that, but this is still sort of kind of part of the mountain. Um, you know, there's the, there's the real peak of it up there. But so this was the start of running around Mount Etna. Um, somewhere here, Sicily 2019, there is a map that I, I think maybe it's in this one that I emailed out to everybody. There it is, Contrada map of Mount Etna. If you look down here, so here's Mount Etna and this semicircle here, this is the Etna DOC, Etna Rosso DOC. So I started out way down here and ran up over the side of Mount Etna up to here where Solacchiata is. There's Solacchiata on the map right there. And then I ended up running over to Rondazzo and stuff too. But anyway, 
uh, back to, where's that other photo? Um, you can see it here, like this, look at that, like that's the soil. It's black volcanic sand, everything, everywhere on Mount Etna. It is all volcanic rock. It's all volcanic material. And it is all, it goes from like, you know, solid solidified lava flows to, you know, they slowly erode and break down. And then they turn into smaller rocks like this one right here. I should stop screen share so that it'll just be this big giant picture of the rock. Um, and then they get smaller and smaller until they turn into gravel and then into uh, dust and get super, super, super fine. Um, so uh, let's see, now I'm going to go back. So now I'll start talking about the history of Mount Etna. I'll try to find some other entertaining picture here. Um, there, that was, that was the first day. That's not a great picture actually, but that was the first day that was running along. That was somewhere like, I ran like 30, I don't know how many miles. Oh, here's a great picture. I'll go with this one. There's Mount Etna. So this is once I got to Frank Cornelison's. That was after like 34 miles or something of running up and over Mount Etna, like up and down switchbacks and stuff. And then I finally got to Solakiata and uh, got to Cave Ox, this wine bar that also has rooms that you can stay in. And I'd been running for like, I don't know, 11 hours, 11 or 12 hours or something like that. And I ended up just like in the back parking lot in the dirt. I just lay down and put my legs up on this fence and just looked at, Mount, at the, like the cone of Mount Etna up there. So it was a thing. That was a time. Um, so Mount Etna, most active volcano in, um, I'll stop screen share. You don't need to look at my legs for that long. So most active volcano in Europe and uh, tallest volcano in Europe, uh, 10,912 feet high, uh, give or take, because it constantly changes, because it's constantly erupting and exploding. So it, like, it gets higher and lower. Um, Etna figures a lot in mythology, of course, because it's this gigantic, gigantic thing that dominates the entire eastern part of Sicily you know like the pictures that I had from last last week from when I was in Sicily in 2019 and I was down south I, I don't know I was like 50 miles south of Etna um, visiting La Maresca and you could still see Etna out there on the horizon like rising above the other hills and stuff there um, and you can see it from way far away you know when you're at sea when you're sailing to Sicily, coming coming down the coast from from Italy, coming across from Messina, um, coming over across from the the Eastern Mediterranean, like Sicily, um, Etna is is huge, and it's 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 visually, physically dominating. So it figures in Greek mythology. Uh, Dionysus was supposedly uh, born there. Uh, the forges of Hephaestus were supposed to be there on Mount Etna. Um, and like I was saying last week, Sicily has been inhabited for at least something like 5,000 years. Um, there are, uh, historically, archaeologically, people made wine in palmentos, palmenti, um, which are basically giant rocks or just, you know, like in volcanic rock, people would, uh, chip away, with whatever tools, you know, they had stone tools, they would slowly grind away and grind troughs in the rock so that you could throw harvested grapes in, crush them by foot. And then there was always like a little trough, a little uh, a cut, like a little um, uh, canal or something from the from the big like area where you would crush the grapes by foot. Every Everybody would, you know, a whole lot of people would be in there, arms linked, dancing and singing 
crushing grapes by foot and then the the juice as it slowly slowly uh was crushed out of the grapes would drain through like a little trough down by gravity into a lower area where there was another large sort of like receptacle open open top receptacle where the juice would then start actually fermenting um but there are there are palmentos like that that are like five thousand years old um around mount etna um so people have been making wine on mount etna for a very very long time um there were very prosperous Greek settlements like Syracuse um, that, you know, that produced wine and exported it. Then the Romans conquered, like I said last, you know, last week, the Romans conquered Sicily and um, that kicked off the Punic Wars, but the Romans conquered Sicily and the Romans wanted Sicily because Sicily was such a like agricultural, a great place for agriculture and the Romans needed it to produce food and wine for their cities, for their, for, you know, for Rome itself. Um, so the Romans did a lot of things like standardizing units of measure, instituting like a standardized taxation system and things like that. And they greatly improved production and yields of grapes and general agricultural produce on Mount Etna. Um, you know, then the Roman Empire broke up and you had the Vandals come through. Then Sicily was conquered by the Moors. Uh, it, was, it was Byzantine uh, for a while. The Moors came through and conquered Sicily. And the, the, the Moors, the Muslims, you know, alcohol was forbidden, but it wasn't really completely enforced. Uh, they let, you know, other, they, they talk about uh, other religions of the book, other Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Christians and Jews. Uh, the Moors back then let Christians and Jews continue worshiping and following their own rules. And because wine figured in religious traditions of those religions, the Moors let Jews and Christians continue producing some wine and consuming wine. They just sort of wanted it to not you just couldn't do it really openly, but it still existed. So, uh, so the winemaking tradition on Sicily and particularly on Mount Etna continued during that time while Etna, you know, while the, the Moors were in control of Sicily. Um, then the Normans conquered Sicily. Uh, Robert Guiscard and then Roger the first and Roger the second and um, when Roger the first finished the conquest of Sicily, he gave a lot of the land around Mount Etna to the Bishop of Catania. And uh, so a lot of the land, you know, ended up belonging to the church, but then the church leased it out at extremely low rates or almost for free to people uh, on like multi-generational leases to farm the land and the church rebuilt a lot of little tiny churches and monasteries and stuff like that all over the mountain and so the church really like did a lot to bring winemaking back on Mount Etna um, after the Normans conquered Sicily so there was so there was definitely a resurgence of winemaking on Mount Etna then uh, there was a lot a lot of like recovery of vineyards, new vineyards were planted, a lot of terraces were built. Uh, then you go through uh, the uh, House of Aragon from Spain and the French, the House of Anjou, sort of fought over Sicily for a while. The Spanish ended up winning. Um, then eventually you had the Napoleonic Wars. Then you that that led into the kingdoms of the, the the kingdom of the two Sicilies because you had Sicily and then you also had like the royal seat uh, of the monarchy was in Naples and they talked about Southern Italy was supposed to be one Sicily and then Sicily was the other Sicily. Sicily. So you had the kingdom of the two Sicilies because for a while they were two kingdoms and then they were combined when uh, the royal houses like combined and intermarried uh, and it became the kingdom of the two Sicilies. But then in the Napoleonic Wars, uh, the Bourbon King of Sicily 
fled from Naples to Sicily, like I was talking about last time, and the British uh, came in and sort of supported the Bourbon King in Sicily and used Sicily as a military staging point and hub to produce a whole lot of food and wine to support their naval war effort all throughout the Mediterranean. But uh, Napoleon's brother was installed as the king in Naples and both of them claimed the crown of the two Sicilies. And so for a while there were, depending on how you look at it, there were four Sicilies during the Napoleonic Wars because you had two different kings claiming to be king of two Sicilies, um, the two kings of the two Sicilies. Uh, that continued Mount Etna's winemaking, uh, status as a winemaking powerhouse because the British needed wine, you know, all over the Mediterranean for all of their different outposts, uh, for the army, for the Navy, for Britain itself. So Mount Etna continued producing a lot of wine, a lot of food, a lot of pistachios, stuff like that, and exporting it. Um, then Italy unified after, after the Napoleonic Wars. So then like Sicily sort of continues producing wine. Mount Etna continues producing wine. Thing doesn't, things don't really change until the reunification of, of uh, Italy where Garibaldi uh, comes across to Sicily from Sardinia, uh, conquers Sicily or you know, stages a revolution and the government in Sicily sort of collapses in on itself and then Garibaldi conscripts people from young men from Sicily and they go across the Straits of Messina and come up the Italian peninsula, conquer Naples and stuff like that. Um, that started a decline of winemaking on Mount Etna because so many young men were conscripted um, and went and fought in the war. And then, uh, you know, like there was a lot of upheaval in Europe uh, then you sort of go on to World War I uh, and World War II, both like both through both of the world wars. Uh, that also hurt wine production on Mount Etna just because there were not a lot of, you know, there were a lot of people left. All through that period, there was a lot of emigration from Sicily to other places, to mainland Italy, to northern Italy, to America. Um, it was a hard time for Sicily. It was a bad time for like winemaking for pretty much everything on, on the island, I think, then at that point. And then there was a real, there was a real like, just not a lot of great winemaking on Mount Etna post-World War II. Um, they're, they're like, people remembered how to make serious wines from the pre-war years. But post-war, the like demand wasn't there. Uh, Europe was destroyed. Um, a lot of people continued to leave Sicily and leave Mount Etna. And reading stories of that time, reading stories from people, um, <clears throat> the real, the real like resurgence of Mount Etna seems to have started in like the eighties, nineties. One producer in particular, Benanti, uh, the like the I don't remember his first name, but uh, doc he was a doctor. Doctor Benanti inherited the estate. I want to say maybe in the eighties, and he could remember drinking old bottles of wine that from Mount Etna that were really good that impressed him, um, but in that time in like the 70s and 80s he couldn't that he, he couldn't find anything current that was that good um somewhere i read a story of like him taking people out to lunch in a trattoria in like rondazzo and drinking wine from mount etna and just being depressed and angry at everything he tasted and being like all of this wine is terrible like we used to make good wine like in my memory i have tasted great wines from mount etna and no one's doing it anymore. Why are we not doing it? And so he, so then he inherited his family's vineyards or took, you know, be, whatever, took over his family's estates and wanted to revitalize winemaking. Um, 
he started working, he experimented with international varieties with like Pinot Noir and stuff like that. Um, and I believe the Benanti winery still does actually grow a bunch of international varieties, but uh, in general, it was indigenous grapes that actually like grew the best and the, produced the most interesting wines or the, the best wines. He really early on when he was just starting out at this, um, one of the first people, or one of the people that he talked to and who worked with him was this guy, Salvo Foti. Um, Salvo Foti, who uh, was from Mount Etna and studied winemaking at university in Palermo. And Salvo was, was young back then. I think this was in the 90s. And he didn't really have a whole lot of experience. But so he talked to uh, Benanti. And then Benanti, along with, he, so he, he hired a bunch of different winemaker consultants. He hired Salva Foti, and he hired a bunch of other consultants, like from mainland Italy and from France as well. And um, all of them sort of came into his vineyards and started experimenting with different grapes and experimenting with different grape varieties and seeing what worked. But it really... It was really that time in the in the 90s, I think, what, that was when people, there were people on Aetna who started trying to raise the bar again and started trying to make like, re, like good wine, started trying to push the boundaries and push quality and not just produce like quantity over quality, not just make like mass produced like jug wine. Um, there also was a period also, I should say, um, in that like post-war period, um, because so many people were moving away from Sicily, from Aetna, um, had been and continued to, but that post-war period, there was the green revolution and like mechanization really came into, um, agriculture and Mount Aetna is a terrible place to try to do things mechanically. Uh, you know, it's so steep, it's so broken up, it's just, uh, it's a terrible place to try to um, use like a standard tractor. I'll see if I can find somewhere that's like a good picture of, um, here. here we go, this will get clear. Um, no. Uh, there, so this is, these are all, these are terraces. I think this is part of the Barbabecki vineyard. So this is up in Solichiata. This is high elevation. This is where some of the magma actually comes from, you know, but like you, you can't, you can't get a tractor through there. Like those terraces are just wide enough for the vines that are on them. Like this terrace down here, there's one row of vines, this terrace, I think there's two that row, there, that terrace, there's one row, that terrace, it looks like there's one. There's a few like almond and fruit trees in here. Um, but you know, like those terraces are hundreds of years old and they're only wide enough for one person to walk through. You can't do stuff mechanically there. So a lot of like, there was also a lot of vineyards were just abandoned back then because like people were moving away. There wasn't the manpower to, like to farm those vineyards um, and you couldn't do it mechanically and everybody was trying to do everything mechanically. And the government was sort of actively pushing to try and like, you know, uh, modernize agriculture and modernize agriculture by like adopting more tech, like science-based techniques to increase production from the green revolution and mechanization in order to like do more with less manpower, which, you know, I mean, in a lot of ways makes sense, but it just didn't make sense for Mount Etna. So uh, back to the 90s, uh, people started to make serious wine on Mount Etna again. And then um, around 2000, I think it was like, I think 2001 is the year that both Frank Cornelison sort of comes to Mount Etna for the first time. And also Andrea Franchetti from Paso Pichiaro comes to Mount Etna. Um, and I, I don't, I'm going to talk a lot about them because I know them pretty well. Uh, there were other, there are, there are lots of other people that have come to Mount Etna and have like helped 
build the reputation and community on Mount Etna, but Andrea Franchetti in particular and Frank Cornelison have played like really large roles in, uh, in it. So both of them come, uh, Frank Cornelison, you know, comes from the, the Netherlands and he was uh, like a wine importer distributor there. Uh, and he just, he saw Mount Etna and was just fell in love with it and decided that he wanted to try to make wine finally on his own on Mount Etna. And, he, and that he, he felt very strongly about, about Mount Etna, that Mount Etna was this amazing, like sort of underappreciated lost terroir that to him seemed as special and unique as Burgundy. Um, and Andrea Franchetti was coming from uh, eight years before that, he'd founded a winery in Tuscany called Pasapiciar, uh, called uh, Tununa de Trignoro, uh, in sort of a overlooked, like abandoned sort of corner of Tuscany that's at particularly high elevation that people were like, that's too high elevation for really serious wines. And he had gone and planted a lot of Merlot and Petit Verdot there and started making really, really special wines and been really successful at that. So he started looking, Andrea Franchetti was looking for even higher elevation vineyards in Europe somewhere or in Italy where he could make interesting wines. And both of them found Mount Etna at the same time when there were still a lot of empty abandoned vineyards there on the mountain. Uh, I'm gonna jump into uh, the climate and I'm gonna go back to screen share here. Um, let's see, back to this map. So I'll zoom right in on that. <clears throat> so I wrote it here in this, but, uh, you know, we, we talk about Mount Etna as this, this single entity where, you know, I say Mount Etna and it's this monolithic, you know, Etna, but Mount Etna itself, Mount Etna actually, is there a, I can't quite read this scale here. Okay, this little line is 10 kilometers. So Mount Etna itself is maybe 20 kilometers wide. So, so you know, it, it took me it took me like 12-ish hours to run from southern Mount Etna to northern Mount Etna. Um, it's huge and you can't make like blanket generalizations because Mount Etna it's it's this huge like footprint of land. And there is this central cone here, and there is, you know, deep underground, there's lava, and there's pressure and stuff, and you have a, a chamber underneath there, but then you have all of these different vents, and you can see different lava flows here marked on this map of the Contrade. Um, uh, oh, yeah, this is a road, actually, that goes up to the top. I ran up it. That was awesome. Um, but so Mount Etna is actually a, a collection of like all these different old calderas, all these different old volcanic cones from different periods that, you know, there was an earthquake and then there was an, uh, you know, an unstable spot on the slope of the mountain here. And finally, like, because, you know, you had like lava over sand, finally the sand underneath like gave way and it slid away and then you had another eruption over there. And so, the mountain is constantly evolving and you have all of these, all these different contours to it. So even um, on, you know, just saying that you're on the north slope, like not all of the slopes here face north, you know, you have slopes that face north, you have slopes that face east, you have slopes that face west, and, uh, you know, you just basically don't have anything here that faces south. Um, in that, uh, in that area. Um, but, uh, so, the, you know, Mount Etna, Sicily is down there. Sicily is a product of the African continent coming in contact with the European continent, running into each other and the African continent getting jammed down underneath the European content, continent and the European continent coming up and creating Sicily and Mount Etna right there. Um, so it's pretty far south. Sicily overall is like sort of subtropical, but then Mount Etna is so such high elevation that it's like practically alpine. It's, it's pre-alpine. Um, 
So you, it's, it's just a really crazy, unique place where parts of it are really warm and tropical, depending on which way the wind is blowing and the time of year. And then parts of it are cold and alpine and dry and like really exposed and harsh. You have snow up on top of the mountain. You can go skiing and stuff like that. And then like you can go down, you can go swimming in the Mediterranean and eat oranges and stuff. It's crazy. Um, and the, uh, the soil, like I was saying, it's basically all volcanic. Eh, two interesting things. A lot of the time when we talk about soil in wine areas, you know, we're talking about soil that's like 20, 30, 40, 50 million years old, you know, and like, oh, this used to be a seabed like 50 million years ago or something like that. Mount Etna, all the soil that the vines are growing in is only a couple, a few thousand years old, you know, like when I was actually I'll go to a picture here of it. When I was in um, the Ivignere, when I was in Salva Foti's vineyard in Milo, uh, I was walking around with his son, Simone, and uh, we were looking at the edge of the vineyard. We were looking at sort of like the hillside against the back of it, and you could see, oh, don't tell me I don't actually have it here. <clears throat> I think I actually have it in a video on the YouTube channel. Um, but at the edge of the vineyard here, you could see uh, lines in the soil and he could, Simone could point to the different lines. Yeah, we were looking at the soil like in here. He could point to different like striations in the soil and be like, oh, that was the eruption you know, in like 2007. And then this line here, that was the eruption in like 1995 and stuff like that. So the soil is just constantly being, uh, is constantly being replenished and renewed. Um, usually it's just, you know, it's like fine ash that accumulates in the vineyard. It's only when you have like a, a large powerful eruption that you get so much matter that it actually forms like a, you know, a really visible line there, but it is just constantly happening. Um, and so even when you get down like, you know, 20, you know, 10, 20 feet underground, like that is mostly generally still volcanic matter that just came out of the core of the earth in the last like, 10 to 15,000 years ago. Um, and that's just, that's very unique. It um, has a lot of different nutrients to it. Uh, it's silica rich. Um, it uh, holds water very well. It, it creates great drainage, but it also, it's like, you know, like looking at these rocks, they are, they're very porous. And so it, 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 provides great drainage for the vines, but it also does trap water in there. And so in the Etna DOC, you're not allowed to irrigate, but there is just, even in the, the middle of the summer when it's extremely hot, there's, a, there's enough water in the soil down in there that the vines can get enough water. So you don't, you don't really need to irrigate on Mount Etna. Um, also super interesting, and I, I didn't really understand how this worked until uh, I was reading the, the New Wines of Mount Etna, the, that new book. Um, phylloxera, the phylloxera louse, uh, it needs a meaningful amount of clay in the soil in order to survive and reproduce. Um, it's, a known, it's a known fact that phylloxera doesn't really do well in sand. I always thought that that was basically because like sand is loose and the little phylloxera bugs couldn't like get around in it. But actually the way it works is that in normal soil that has, you know, um, some amount of clay in it, phylloxera, the little bug can like crawl around in the soil. It will dig down into the soil, lay its eggs and they will, whatever, they'll be there asleep over winter. And then uh, in the, uh, once it gets dry in the summer, 
with like normal soil that's denser and has clay, as the soil dries out, it will crack and open up. And that allows air in and allows the eggs to hatch. And the like next generation of phylloxera allows to like come out and you know propagate itself. Um, sand doesn't do that. If you have just really, really sandy soil, it won't, it doesn't ever crack open. It just stays sand. Also, sand soaks up solar radiation and gets really hot. And be, that combination of sand never, you know, cracking open and letting air in and produce pro, like having fissures like that and getting really hot in the summer, sand, it seems like it, it kills phylloxera that way. They can't reproduce and the heat in the summer can kill the bugs. And so that's why you don't have phylloxera in sandy vineyards. And a lot of Mount Etna is particularly sandy. So a lot of people, there are a lot of ungrafted grapevines on Mount Etna. Um, people are experimenting more with it. When I was talking to Simone, uh, you know, at Sal Salvapoti's son, he said that they'd actually planted several acres of Minella and Caracante vines on their own roots there that were ungrafted. Uh, they had just done it and they were really excited to see what had happened. I actually just followed up with him and he said that they've been working with the university in Palermo to like see what the results are. And they think they're gonna need like one more year until they can actually say like, here's what the results are like, you know, and publish results of it. But he was like, yeah, it is very different. Like the vines act differently when they're ungrafted. The grapes are different. Like it will, it does change the wine. It'll be really interesting. So, um, so there are ungrafted vines and there's definitely the potential for more ungrafted vines and, and it has an impact on the wines up there. Uh, 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 yeah, so the Etna DOC, um, it's that semicircle ring around the uh, side, the north, where is it here? North, east, and west of the mountain. <clears throat> and the idea is basically that like, Everything through here is at similar elevations. Um, and vines here in the south, they get sun in the afternoon, they get the setting sun, but they don't get the rising sun. And vines over here in the north, they get sun in the morning, but they don't get setting sun. So all both the vines, all the vines around here don't get like full sun. And so they all, sort of like, even though they get sun at different times of the day, they're, they're in sort of similar, you know, they get a similar amount of sun. It's just the west side of the mountain over here gets so much sun being sort of west facing that the wines from over there are different and don't sort of like, they just don't have the same character as the wines from the rest of the slopes of Etna. That was, that was the justification that I've read. Um, and that they wanted to have the Edna DOC be basically at sort of the same like similar elevation. Um, it's not a very strict DOC. Uh, there aren't like strict aging requirements. There aren't like really strict requirements about what grape varieties you can grow, which is good because so much of the vineyards, the vineyards have so many field blends, you know, in them. Like you've got Norella Mescalese and Norella Capuccio, but then you've also got like Garnacha, you've got Alicante Busquet, you've got San Giovese, you've got a, I don't even know, you. I think there's some Nero Davila, um, there's a lot of different whites, there's Greco, Caracante, Cotterado, Minella, uh, there's some Alianico I know around, like there's, and there's just stuff that people don't even know, there are, there are grape varieties that people are still trying to figure out like what this is. Um, and propagate them. There are a lot of people actually like intentionally doing that work now on Mount Etna, um, propagating and studying old grape varieties. Uh, let's start tasting wine. So first up, the white Aurora from Salva Foti. Uh, this is 90% um, 
Caracante and 10% Minella. Caracante is the most common white grape on Mount Etna. Um, it's a super productive grape variety. Uh, le legend, I was you know reading different things and uh, I read about a legend uh, the, the legend of some particular Caracante vine like, like from down on like the seashore by uh, by Catania where it's you know like warm lower elevation humid and stuff like that and there's a legend that one vine on its own could produce four gallons of wine which is a lot of wine um, and the name Caracante is like a derivation of the Italian of an Italian word or term to carry a heavy load um, but Caracante, when it's grown up on the up on the mountain at higher elevation, the yields go down and it has more character. Oh my God. I'm not sure, but I think this bottle is corked. Well, I'm not sure, but I think some of you probably have a very slightly corked bottle of um, of Caracante. Ah, geez. So the bottle up in, in Bar Harbor is corked too, great. Yeah, mine is just very, very, very slight. That's good, um, that's sad. I actually, I opened a bottle of this earlier in the week just to like taste it, just cause I wanted to drink it. Um, and uh, and it was beautiful. It's definitely you know. So the vintage of this is 2016. So it's an it's a like it has a little bit more age to it. Um, it's a good expression of uh, of Caracante. Like it's not super ripe and tropical. It's not like a super expressive grape variety. but it's pretty medium bodied, a little aromatic, and it's very salty. Um, and I think that's a product of where it comes from. I'll see if I have a good, I think maybe this one. Okay, that's actually, this is looking, so this is at Salvafoti's Vineyard in Milo. That's actually looking up at Mount Etna. Um, that's looking down. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna see if I have. All right. So you can't actually, you can just barely sort of tell here, but that's the ocean right there. Uh, that's, a, that's a point of land sticking out. This is the ocean. That's the, this is the town of Milo right there. And these are all of their Caracante and Minella vines there. So it was crazy when I went and visited here. Um, I drove up to there from, uh, from where I was staying down in uh, Catania. I'll come over here. So Milo is like right here. So it's, it's on that Eastern side of the volcano facing the Ionian Sea. So it's very exposed to weather coming in off of the sea. Um, and let's see, so that's, that's 10 kilometers. Um, so from where Milo was, it was like maybe three miles, I think, from, from the ocean, but it was like 2,500 feet above sea level. So it was really, it was kind of surreal feeling that, uh, I, like, so I, I drove up there and I got there early uh, because I wanted to go for a run. So I got there like 45 minutes or something early and ran back and forth all around the town, like ran up and down the side of the mountain here and stuff like that. And like I was up here on this mountain, you know, like relatively high elevation, but it felt and smelled exactly like I was actually at the seashore because I could just like, it was, the air was so salty and humid and stuff like that. It really, if I closed my eyes, I could believe that I was literally just standing there on 
the on a beach like that on the Mediterranean. And so the like the vines and the wine here really like they taste like the ocean. Um, all right, so then moving on to the first red wine, also from Salvo Foti. This is his Rosso. This is his Etna Rosso. This is also 2016. Um, let me go to a picture of in the vineyard. No, go away. No. Uh, I mean, in the winery. So Salvo Foti is, a, is an, an interesting and important guy. Uh, do I have others? No, okay. Um, he, here we go, here's in the winery. That's a clay, clay amphora set into the ground. Um, so Salvo Foti, is like from here, from the area, <clears throat> studied winemaking. And then he started working as a like consultant winemaker as an enologist around Mount Etna. But he pretty quickly, he it, like listening to him talk, he says that when he was a kid, his great grandfather drilled into him and his siblings that if they wanted to make good wine, you know, like that his family had vineyards and they made wine for themselves, for themselves. But his great grandfather drilled into them that if they wanted to make good wine, they had to start with good grapes that like everything else, you know, winemaking, whatever you do, how you harvest, how you make the wine, um, what really matters. Um, let me look this up. Uh, what really, really matters is just starting with good grapes. If you don't start with good grapes, like that's you, you're not you're not going to make good wine. Um, I am looking now. So some somewhere I have a whole lot of pictures of what a palmento actually looks like, but because uh, for actually because I'm an idiot, I didn't actually put all of them on this computer. But here is, can I just open, I just wanna get this picture, Never mind. So this right here, this is what a palmento is. You have this upper area here where there's like a depression where you can, where like grapes would go in, they might come in like through that window up there, get thrown in, land here in this depression, and then people could trod them by foot. But then you also have this press and you're probably asking yourself or saying to yourself, what, how is that actually a press? It's this gigantic, gigantic piece of maybe oak, maybe chestnut, because primarily what grows up on Mount Etna is chestnut. Um, and you have, it has a fulcrum right here in the center. And then over here, you could put the grapes, like the grapes after you've crushed them with your feet, you could mound them all up and like wrap them up with rope or fabric or something like that into basically like a cake. And then you could, uh, take out there would be, you know, you'd have like a, like a jack stand, basically. You'd have like a piece of wood, a prop supporting this thing. You would kick that out. And then the full weight of this beam would come to rest on that cake of partially like crushed macerated grapes and press more juice out of them. And then if you want to put more pressure on them, you start, you put a, put a, a pole through that hole right there. And then you have a bunch of people here walking around with it, turning this giant wooden screw and it raises this end of what is essentially a gigantic lever. It raises that up and puts more like force, more leverage on this end over here, pressing the grapes. It's kind of crazy. Um, they have been using that 
since the Romans, at least, like Pliny the Elder writes about that. And, and actually Pliny and Cato uh, wrote about um, that type of a press. Uh, I forget what, a, uh, uh, what exactly it's called, type of press, but they wrote about that press. Um, and then also they, they wrote about how to refine it and improve, improve it. And you can see like the improvements that they made in those still existing on Mount Etna. Those are super rare nowadays because they are really um, difficult. They take a lot of like work and they take a lot of skill. You really have to know what you're doing because if you mess it up, if you do that slightly wrong, you're dealing like that, le that huge beam of wood. I forget what that weighs, like a thousand, a thousand pounds, several thousand pounds. If you mess it up, you know, like it's very easy for the fulcrum that it rests on to break and that to fall down and crush people. Um, so very few people still use them. And also they're, I think they're, they're basically illegal under the laws of the EU, under food, food production laws and the rules of the Aetna DOC. Um, but people, if you, if you have one that's existing, like there are some win wineries that have existing palmentos with presses like that, and they're still using them. They're sort of like whether or not you're supposed to, whether the wine that you make from it is, if you're, whether you're allowed to sell it is all sort of a gray area. It's definitely illegal to build a new one, but some people are still using existing palmentos and presses like that. So anyway, so Salva Foti has one that is still operational that he still uses. And if you look around on YouTube, there are several videos of it. Uh, I have a, I put a video on my YouTube channel of Simone, me and Simone there, and Simone explaining how it works and everything. And then um, if you look around, though, there are actually videos from Salvo Foti of it, like actually in action pressing grapes. So this, the Etna Rosso, this is from a palment, from his palmento. This is um, grapes crushed by foot, um, spends eight days on the skin. Uh, fermented with natural yeast, um, and then it's aged in uh, aged in those buried clay amphora, those terracotta amphora in the ground. Um, there was something else important I was going to say about this. Oh, right, Salvo Foti in particular. Salvo Foti is really important. So he started out as a wine as a consultant winemaker, but he 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 wanted. You know, he was he was working back in that like 80s, 90s like period, and he was passionate about Mount Etna and was wanted to help produce great wine on Mount Etna. And going back to what his great grandfather had told him that you have to start with good grapes, he realized his his epiphany, his truth was that you need talented, educated farmers. You need people growing grapes who really know what they're doing. You can't, if you want to make great wines in a place like Mount Etna that was not already making great wine, you can't start by training salespeople or training winemakers. Where you have to start with the farmers, you have to start with like farmhands, with campaninos, with the people like actually growing the grapes. And so Salvo Foti created this organization called I Vigneri. Um, which is a name coming from a consortium of farmers that was formed in Catania, the city there at the foot of Etna back in 1435, 1435. So Salvo Foti basically like tried to reform, restart this organization, this consortium of campesinos, of farmers, of grape growers um, to help teach small landholders, small families, small scale farmers, try to really teach them best practices for growing grapes. Um, and he works organically. This is like uh, vino umano, as they call it, like human wine, uh, wines made by hand, like vineyards worked by hand, people out in the vineyards working with hose, doing everything manually. Um, but that's what Salvo Foti, that's like really what his life's work has been. Um, passing on those techniques and teaching farmers, teaching small scale farmers. And through that sort of like co-op consortium of Evigneri working with a ton of different farmers and winemakers to make sure that they're producing great grapes in the vineyard and starting with great, really healthy grapes. So 
and you know, and, and then everything that he does is basically organic. Um, that's not his end goal. It's just that working organically, he believes that's the best way to produce great grapes. Um, I want. I think at this point, even Yeri oversees something like fifty hectares of vines around Mount Etna. So it's like it's a lot. Um, a lot of people have benefited and learned from from what he did, and he is, you know, he's still he's a he's a giant of the Mount Etna and Sicilian wine industry because he works with producers on other parts of Sicily as well. And now he's, you know, like trying to propagate old grape varieties and experiment with ungrafted grape vines and stuff like that. So still going. I'm going to, I should talk about this really quickly. Also, this is a good example of um, Norello Mascalese. It's not that dark in color. Norello means little dark. Uh, it means, you know, it's a grape that doesn't have a ton of pigment. It has a lot of structure, but Norello Mascalese never, it, it really never has tons and tons of pigment. It's not inky and black. It's not Malbec. It's, it's not, you know, Movedra. It smells very pretty to me. Sort of cherry, cherry wood, a little bit spicy, a little bit brambly, both like fresh cherry, dry, a little bit of dried fruit too. Smells a little bit salty. This is 2016 and that's still got excellent structure, like the acidic structure up front and the tannin on the finish. Like this is very like linear, structured, like I wouldn't call it tight, but it's wine that's like firm and has a purpose, you know, it's, it's like, it's a serious wine. I and mean, it reminds me of like, of the people on Mount Etna, like a lot of the people on Mount Etna that I've interacted with and talked to, like they're serious, like they work hard. It's a, like, it's a hardworking, like meaningful, you know, like passionate driven place. And like these wines sort of taste like that. Medium bodied, uh, more sort of like dried cherry, a little bit of amaro on the finish there. And that, uh, the, the Rosso, that comes from their vineyards in Rondazzo over on the north side of Mount Etna. That's not from Milo. The vineyards in Milo, that east coast of Mount Etna is generally a little too like cool and rainy and windy uh, to be like really good for red wine, as far as I know, as I understand it. Um, Mount Etna, Mount Etna gets somewhere between 25 to 75 centimeters of rain per year. Um, that's a very broad range. Uh, that's three times. And um, I think that's because like the east coast of the eastern side of Mount Etna gets a lot of rain. And then the north and southern sides get significantly less rain. And then the west side of Mount Etna gets a lot less rain. Moving on to Romeo Castello. Uh, this is a winery from, um, is this Paso Pichiaro? Uh, Rondazzo, Rondazzo is the greater, larger sort of area. I want to say this is like basically sort of like Paso Pichiaro, which is like that north. I will go back to my map here. pictures of Mount Etna. So, uh, Allegra Cori, so there's Pasapichiaro right there. I'm not sure actually if Allegra Cori, so this is, uh, I think, Alle oh, there it is. All right, so there's Allegra Cori right here. Allegra Cori is the name of the Contrada. Um, and it's right over here. So you have Paso Pichiaro, Monte La Guardia, and then the town of Rondazzo over there at the edge. So here's Allegra Corre. 
Um, and so Fattoria, uh, Romeo and Castello is actually like right, right here. Um, so this lava flow was from, uh, doesn't, oh wait, is that, okay, 1981, that's right. So this was one of Etna's most recent, one of Etna's most violent, serious eruptions in like recent memory. Um, this eruption in 1981, where this huge lava flow came down through here, destroyed a whole bunch of, you know, vineyards and houses and stuff like that. And it was coming right straight for the Romeo Castello vineyard. And then right as it got there, it, it destroyed some of their land or it covered some of their land. And then it just suddenly took this right hand turn and just went Meep over here and then turned and went down and ran into the Alcantara River over there and stopped. Um, but it, it was, you know, things like this happen on Mount Etna because the mountain is so unpredictable. The, the, bulk, the eruptions are so unpredictable. And it's like these things like this that seem miraculous happen on a, miraculous things happen on a semi-regular basis on Mount Etna. Living on Mount Etna is just sort of like a miraculous thing. You're constantly faced with crazy, crazy things that shouldn't exist. Um, and in particular, the, um, like, I don't know, patron, most famous saint, patron saint, uh, saint of um, Mount Etna is um, Santa Gata, Saint Agatha, who was a Christian, Christian woman uh, in the, I don't, I don't know what year it was, but it was when Sicily was Roman and she uh, refused to recant her Christian faith, refused to, uh, refused the, as it was put to me, she refused the attentions of a wealthy Roman aristocrat. Uh, and she was terribly, brutally tortured. They cut off her breasts, things like that. Eventually she was killed. And then uh, one year later on the day that she was killed, Mount Etna erupted and destroyed, I forget, I forget, a lot of, a, a lot of Catania and stuff like that. And the eruption was finally stopped. Uh, I believe when her remains were brought there was a lava flow coming down and her remains were like brought up to it and the lava flow stopped. And I wanna say that happened twice, I think in Mount Etna's history, they did it again. Um, Eleanor, the queen of Sicily, the wife of one of the Norman Kings, uh, maybe it was the second Roger, uh, stopped a lava flow that was on its way to Catania by bringing out Santa Agata's remains and the lava flow stopped. So anyway, Romeo Castello over here. So this is, um, this one, I think the Allegra Corre is younger vines. They also have a bunch of like 100, 100 plus year old, very old vines that goes into a uh, different cuvee, the Vigo. Um, Allegra Corre is a mix of old and younger vines. Um, it's a woman, Chiara, who um, who actually basically sort of learned about winemaking. Does it say Chiara's name on here? It does not. Um, Chiara learned a lot about winemaking and farming from Salva Foti. Um, Salva Foti and Ivignieri, uh, like helped her when she she had gone away she moved like gone to school and moved away and then she came back to help run her family's farms and vineyards farm and vineyards and um Salvo Foti like talk, taught her about winemaking and stuff so this is um organically farmed hand harvested native yeast fermentation this is done in stainless steel and I want to say this is aged for like 16 16 months I believe before bottling also the 2016 vintage. And it smells so different from Salvo Fotis. So like, you know, like they're, this is same vintage. They're both Norello Mascalese with a little bit of other stuff in, but primarily Norello Mascalese. Um, very, very similar farming, similar winemaking. This was not aged in clay amphora. This was done in stainless steel. But this smells a little bit more like chocolatey to me. It smells sweeter, you know, in like a, just in like a riper fruit, like black cherry kind of way. 
like a little bit like baking cherry, a little bit like like coffee grounds, like mocha, a little dustier. It seems a little bit brighter, a little bit juicier. Um, still has great structure, but it's just like a little bit prettier. Tasting it, it's like like a little bit more like fresh, tart, like raspberry cherry fruit where the Salvafotis Etna Rosso was a little bit more like savory and a little bit more dried fruit and concentrated and stuff like that. There even I don't even I don't know exactly where the vineyard for Salvo Fotis, you know, Rosso came from, but his vineyard is over here in the environs of Rondazzo. So like they come from very nearby to to each other. Um, okay, on to a younger wine now. This is the Flavia, which we tasted last week as uh, my Etna representative for last week's Sicilian talk. And let's see. So this is uh, this is two years younger, and um, oh, that's not what I want. Uh, two years younger, mostly Norella Mescalese with some Norella Cappuccio in it. Let's see. This is done in stainless steel. And uh, like I was saying last week, this is, so this is a brother and sister, and this is the very first vintage, uh, Flavia and Giacomo are the two of them. And this is the very first vintage that they've actually bottled here. Their family has owned vineyards here for a bunch of generations, but this is the first time that they've actually bottled wine themselves instead of selling it off. And they're in, if I remember correctly, I want to say that they have so their their vineyards are over here more in the in the, the region of Solicata. Um, I want to say they have some vineyards in Malpaso, and then they have some somewhere else too. I think over here they have a couple of different vineyard plots, um, but they're over here in like the the Solicata area. And you can see some of the. Uh, the topographical numbers here. So over here, that's 555 meters above sea level. Here, the town of Solicata, that's 701 meters above sea level, Pesciaro, six 654 meters. So all pretty high elevation, but um, it definitely like down in here, it gets a little bit like, it gets a little bit flatter. And up here, it's a little bit steeper and a little bit um, wackier, a little bit more, you know, chaotic and, and broken up in terms of, um, of exposure. I'm actually, I'm not sure if I have any pictures of the Malpaso vineyard. When I was there in 2019, I wandered around and I tried to take as many pictures of different individual contratas as I could as I was wandering about. But, oh, here we go. Uh, this is down, this is down more like, I think near, this is more near like where they are. This is like that that part of Solicata down a little bit lower.
Much riper fruit. I mean, it's, it's younger. It's a little bit juicier to me. The tannins are all the tannins are also like a little bit more. I, I don't know. I shouldn't say like aggressive, but the tannins are a little bit more tannic on the finish. It's cherry, but it's also more sort of like ripe raspberry, like 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 black raspberry stuff like that. A little a little bit more like juicy berry. But also kind of floral. Also a little bit of like rose and stuff like that. I totally, if any of you want to chime in with what you're smelling or tasting, either uh, verbally or through messages, I feel absolutely feel free with all these wines. Like the others, it has a nice salt mineral component. And I really like that. I really like, I really value that in that wine, in all of these wines. It helps make them great food wines, but I also just, I love that, that dimension of these. And again, like the others, you know, like it's not super dark in color, but it's a pretty structured, pretty like serious, forceful wine, not super heavy. Um, People compare Norella Mascalese to Nebbiolo, and I do think that that's a pretty apt comparison. Um, I've actually been drinking a whole lot of Nebbiolo over the past week because I think two weeks out from now, that's what I'm going to do this seminar about. I'm going to do Nebbiolo. Um, I'm going to drink a lot of, we'll drink a lot of Barolos and Barbarescos and Roero and stuff like that. But um, it's been cool drinking a bunch of uh, Mount Etna Norello Mascalese and a bunch of different Piedmont Nebbiolos side by side over the past week. Mm. Yeah, juicier, juicier, like more berry fruit, but like still similar tannin, acidic tannin, salt in the middle sort of structure that gives the wine like purpose and poise and like real presence, real like real staying power. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> All right, now going on to wine number five. This is Paso Pichiaro. I don't have any pictures of actually I'll go to the old ones. I don't have any pictures of Andrea Franchetti, the owner of Paso Pichiaro, um, because I think he is a hard guy to find. He's always moving and always traveling. But well, actually, here we go. <clears throat> uh, this was on my way running from Actually, this was just running around, but this was running like basically from Frank Cornelison's winery over to where um, Pasapiciaro is. Um, Pasapiciaro, which is both the name of this, this winery and then also the name of that town there on the north slope of Mount Etna. But um, this was this is what the landscape is like up there. This was so I'm standing on the road. That's the viewpoint, and that's where all these rocks came from, just from like clearing clearing enough space to have a road and pave it they you know they just pushed up rocks over there and then you know it's up high enough that like and and this and it's just rocks so it's like the the vegetation is just sort of like scrub bushes like that uh but moving on to more pictures of Pasapiciaro. Where is completely unreal? Well, this is a vineyard. That's one of that's one of Pasapiciaro's signs. 
this is one of the contradas that Pasapiciaro owns land in. This is the uh, Guardiola Vineyard, which is right like by the Pasapiciaro Winery. Um, look at how tight together these vines are. The vines are planted very close together. Um, and I think there. All right, this is uh, that's Vin Vincenzo Vincenzo Lomaro, and um, Pasapiciaro. <clears throat> is owned by Andrea Franchetti. And it's, you know, like Andrea Franchetti came here and was like, this is amazing land, bought this, bought this land and was like, so there were some vines here, but he also planted a lot of vines. Um, Andrea hired this guy to plant, do, to do it all, to plant all the vines, do all the work, like put it together, make it happen. Um, Vincenzo's family has been here for a super long time and he oversaw all of this planting. He was a little skeptical um, about uh, planting at like this like density, um, but it worked out. They all like the vines thrived. They're trained pretty low. Uh, they are trained like up on wire trellises, as you can see here. Um, I'll get over to more recently, some more pictures of Vincenzo. Uh, yeah, this is, these are some of the vineyards that Pasapiciaro farms. And oh, that's a super old map that they have in the winery of different contratas. There's Vincenzo, Vincenzo hanging out in his winery. Um, so this, so Shiniri, this wine, this is, um, let's see. Oh, so uh, Shiniri is, Michael's asking uh, what Shiniri refers to. Um, Shiniri, is Italian for something I've forgotten exactly what it means. Um, I should look it up. Um, but it is, uh, it's not a new lava flow. It's a, it's a particular, it's a reference to uh, a particular like type of, uh, of lava flow, I think. Um, Shiniri is a particular blend. Um, Pasapiciaro, the winery, makes a huge, like, broad range of different wines. There's Paso Rosso, which is a blend of grapes from, like, from their different vineyards, from different contratas. Um, then they make individual bottlings from different contratas. Uh, Chiniri is a particular blend that is a mix of I want to say Norella Mascalese, but it's also got um, Petit Verdot in it. And there's something else weird that I did not. It's, it's some indigenous grapes, but then also a bunch of grapes that Andrea planted here. Uh, Petit Verdot, Cesanese, that's right. So it's Norella Mascalese, Cesanese. And, uh, and Petit Verdot that he planted here um, because he works a lot with Chesanese and with Petit Verdot uh, at his winery in Tuscany and, and like likes them at high elevations. So this is, um, and some of, some of the grapes also come, I think from outside of the Etna DOC range, they come from uh, like lower elevation down outside of the, the, the DOC. So this is, you can see here, it's Terra Siciliane. It's not Etna DOC wine, uh, but it is, uh, so done in, ferments in steel vats over 15 days. Um, and then it spends 10 months in big, large old oak casks, like the ones that Vincenzo was standing in front of. So it's not all Norello Mascalese 
but it to me it still is like is very much a like clear expression of Etna. <clears throat> Um, the Pasapichiaro wines in general, I find like the style of, of their wines is usually a little bit like more forceful, a little bit more intense, um, a little bit like riper and like, and spicier. Um, and this, to me, this like, this lives up to that. But also because it's not just Norello Mascalese. It's not, it's not just, it's not as cherry dominated as those Norello Mascaleses were. It's a little bit like juicier to me. It still has this, it still has like the same great acidic and tannic structure. It's still very like linear, um, but it, uh, the flavors are a little bit juicier, like grapier, and um, less floral than the Norella Mascalese was. Um, so Andrea Franchetti, along with Frank Cornelison, Andrea Franchetti has probably, I don't know, he's been doing probably more than anybody else to push the Contrada system on Mount Etna. Um, Etna, because of the land is so complicated because it's so like crazy and broken up and has all these different exposures and stuff like that. Um, I don't know how old they are. It's, it's an old system, the Contrada, you know, naming different little pieces of land uh, for like these different names, Contradas has been around for a long time. Um, but uh, Andrea Franchetti and Frank Cornelison have been put have have like developed them and promoted them they've been the, the primary forces doing that um i actually i got i got this map from pasapiciaro i got this map from vincenzo um when i was there in 2019 and i was so excited to finally have a map like this a topographical map with all the different contradas, at least here on the north slope of Mount Etna, where they where they are, I was like, "Oh my God, I can't! I like I can't believe you have this." And I took as many copies as I could, and I brought them back, and then I like scanned them and photocopied it and stuff, and it felt like I was like escaping from Sicily with like like special proprietary information. Anyway, um, so all the different contradas, like these are little zones. I I think of them like uh like premier crew vineyards in burgundy um because in general the contradas aren't very big like they're they're not large pieces of land some are bigger some are smaller um but they're uh they're not huge but different people own land in them um you have you know so there there are some contradas that are owned exclusively by one person or one family. But in general, like most contradas are owned, they're different families, different people own different portions of them. Um, and then other people like rent parts or buy fruit from them and stuff like that. Um, and I don't know that they're really completely actually legally controlled. Um, but uh, actually, I'm pretty sure that they're I'm, I think they're not because I actually, when I was there in 2019, different winemakers were sort of arguing about like whether a piece of land was a part of one contrada or another. Um, it's still slightly un, unformed um, or, or not completely codified yet. Um, Andrea Franchetti, uh, I forget when what the year was, but Andrea Franchetti started uh, a yearly tasting uh, Le Contrade Della Etna, I think it's called. Uh, it's a spring spring tasting where all the winemakers like get together 
and open usually like their new vintages that are still in tank that they may not may not be you know available or bottled yet um but everybody comes together and i think originally it was at maybe pasapicio at his winery i don't know if it still is i think it's moved somewhere bigger um but uh he started uh, this yearly gathering and that has grown and that's turned into like the big like primary like tasting where everybody on that sort of like comes together and like compares and tastes and talks to each other and stuff like that um and also uh Andrea Franchetti and Frank Cornelison you know started bottling a lot of their wines doing individual Contrada bottlings and labeling them as such to start getting the idea out there, pushing the idea into people's minds of different contradas and that they matter. And they really, they really do, because you have you go from like one contrada, like uh, I think I still hopefully have the picture open of like this one. No, darn it. Where is it? Uh, the Porcaria vineyard, which was right here. So you go from like this, where like, look at that. Like this is, you know, very light, fine, sandy, like dusty soil, you know, and it's like relatively flat here. And then you go to a vineyard like uh why is it not where is that here like uh here like the barbara becky vineyard where it's all terraced and it's higher elevation and stuff like that so anyway so the individual contratas have very they have very different characters from each other but when you taste wines that are from the same contrada you like they're in the taste how they taste there is a commonality to them so it's not it's not just a marketing thing it really is there are very real noticeable differences between the individual places um last wine Eduardo Torres Acosta Versante Nord. And this is actually, I feel like this is a great one to sort of like transition onto going from Andrea Franchetti, Paso Pichiaro, because Eduardo um, was the winemaker at Paso Pichiaro. Uh, Eduardo, so this, this wine, 2017, I'm not sure if Eduardo was still the winemaker here at Paso Pichiaro in 2017. That may have been his last year here, I think. Um, but I, I let's just say it was. So Eduardo was the winemaker at Paso Pichiaro for that 2017 Shiniri. At the same time, I think he was starting to make like his first vintage of his own wine. And he actually did that in Ariana Occupinti's winery down in Vitoria. Uh, now he has his own little tiny winery in the town of Solchiata, and I'm going to go find pictures of it right now. 2019. Where is Eduardo? There's Eduardo. Look at that guy. Eduardo is a super nice, nice guy um, who's very good at winemaking. Uh, hey, there it is. Oh, wait, that's the white wine. That's the Versante Nord white that I was drinking there. There's his little tiny winery. There's all the wines. There's his barrels. There's Vincenzo. Anyway, um, so uh, Eduardo farms about, let me get out of screen share. He farms about five hectares total of vines, um, mostly over in like the Rondazzo area. So this is a blend of primarily Norello Mascalese, but also with some uh, Norello Cappuccio, some um, Garnacha in it, uh, which here is called Alicante. Um, 
primarily Neuralomusculase. And uh, at this point, I have forgotten what is, how he makes this. Um, okay. Oh, this actually, a bunch of the grapes from this come from the Allegra Core, uh, Contrada over there. Um, all Alborello trained vines. Alborello is that little, like the vines growing on their own, you know, at, like little trunk with little arms coming off of them, not trained up on anything. Um, um, so the grapes are co-fermented, so they're harvested all together, co-fermented, ferment with native yeasts, no sulfur added, no temperature control in concrete, those concrete tanks that you saw, that's where he does the initial fermentation. That lasts around 15 days. And then he ages the wine in a mix of concrete tanks and those older, used barrels for 16 months before he bottles them. Uh, no filtration, no fining, tiny bit of sulfur added at bottling, but that's it. This smells more floral to me. It smells a little prettier. It smells a little bit more perfumey. It's cherry, it's cherry, but I also smell pomegranate from it. And there's like, it's, it's a pretty fruit driven aroma but they're like lurking in behind those, those aromas. There's also a little bit of something like smoky and savory. Yeah, ooh, yeah. Really ripe, juicy plums from Erica. Hmm. It's got an interesting different finish. It's tannic. It's got the same like tannic structure as the others, but there's this flavor in the finish that's like a little bit more, well, quite tannic on that mouthful. It's more like plummy, like, like tart, fresh cherry in the finish. Like it's, it's a little, it's a little different from how the other was, uh, from how all the others were sort of were finishing up. Yeah. Ned, how does the alcohol level on this one compare to the others? They are all about the same. This is 13 and a half percent. Um, Romeo Castello and Flavia were 14. Shaniri was 14. The uh, Salvo Fotis red was 13 and a half. Um, this, this, just, this ta it tastes like it's tighter to me right now. Like this, this tastes like it just needs more time in the bottle or it like needs time to breathe and open up a little bit. It just tastes like the acidity and the tannin are both a little bit more aggressive on this one. But the fruit flavors are like a little bit, they just seem a little bit prettier to me. Like something something about his wines, I always, I feel like they're they're always a little bit prettier. They're, they're very elegant. Like they're still, Eduardo's wines, are very Etna, like they're still gritty, 
and structured, like they have strength and like like bow, uh, backbone to them. Um, but they're like, there's just something about the flavors that's a little bit more elegant um, than I than I get from from other Etna wines usually. Um, I also this one this this right now this bottle isn't tasting like it, but from some of his other wines, I I often get like a volcanic like sort of ashy like char sort of thing from them and I'm not really like picking it up right now here on this on this bottle but but that's something I've get, gotten from his wines in the past um I've got to address Frank Cornelison too because he's Frank Cornelison uh and he was a I mean Frank is actually how I discovered Mount Etna um because there he is. So, so I, you know, I ran, I spent all day running. This is a tiny little picture of Mount Etna right there. I spent all day running up around Mount Etna, got here to Solichiata where Frank lives in the, in the evening, like, I don't know, five something o'clock, maybe something like that. Um, Frank met me there at K of Ox and, you know, gave me like half an hour to take a shower or something like that. And then we hopped in his car and we came over to his winery. And, you know, and so this is, this is, these are topographical maps of Mount Etna here. This is the North side. And these are different Contrada, Contrada that he has land in. And, you know, he just immediately launched into like talking about everything and explaining everything. And we started, uh, yeah, there's a zooming in on, yeah, Malpaso. Um, I think that's Solicata right there. That's Sol that's Solicata. Anyway, um, these are clay amphora that he's got set into the floor um, that he uses for different single vineyard uh, Mungibel bottlings. So some of his different Contrada bottlings. I'm actually not sure how much he uses these anymore. He's sort of moved on from um, amphora to more just like epoxy tanks because they, in his mind, they behave very much the same. Like they, they affect the same in the wine, the wine in the same way. They're totally inert. They're not conductive of electricity or ions. They're not temperature, like thermal conductors. So anyway, um, but he's still got these and he still uses them. He was using them. You know, this was back in February of 2016 when I was there. Uh, so, you know, he still had wine in them. So it was at this point, it was night. It was dark out. It was dinner time. And we just came in and we started tasting through all the different amphora here, pulling samples out and crawling around on the floor, drinking all these different single vineyard um, Etna bottlings. That's the Zocco Nero uh, Contrada there. So Frank, you know, came to Mount Etna in 2001, started experimenting, making wine, and he really wanted to make wine that just tasted like the mountain. He wanted to make wine that tasted like liquid rock, you know, and he was like, I'm just going to do it. And I don't care what people think about it. Like, I'm just going to, because, because he sort of admittedly, he didn't know what he was doing in the beginning. So he was like, what's the big deal? Like, if I, if I like mess things up or like, I'm not, it's not like I'm like a fancy winemaker coming into like Santa Steph Bordeaux or something, you know, like I, I'm just, I'm going to like try and see what I can do and experiment. Um, but he wanted to make wines that tasted like Mount Etna. And so he didn't want to add stuff to them in the winery. He just wanted to like work with great, ripe, perfect grapes and so he became a natural winemaker um, without, I think, necessarily setting out to be like a dogmatic natural winemaker. And he's really not actually dogmatic. He's happy to use technology in any way he can in the, to further that goal of making wines that are beautiful, pure expressions of Mount Etna. Um, and what he does has evolved a lot over time. Um, you know, as he's learned more and he's, you know, and as he's had experiences of 
wines of wines that he made like not shipping well or or things like that um so here's other pictures of him like he was really excited you know that he'd gone to these special synthetic corks that are patented that let a very precise amount of oxygen of air through you know every, at, a, at a constant rate so that he could control the exposure there's the line of corks going into the bottling machine and he had all these air filters he had heat pumps with air filters with ionizing elements in them to keep any bacteria from outside of the winery getting in um there he is using so those are you know some of the epoxy tanks that are really common in natural wineries now um so anyway um yeah just saying like frank is is not not dogmatic about uh in general about technology he just wants to make wine that's very very pure and he doesn't want to add anything to it um and like so he did that and he was just doing his own thing but um you know he's in love with mount etna and he you know he didn't want to just come in as somebody from somewhere else and like he he knew that he didn't know anything so he wanted to learn he was very respectful of the place and the people and their traditions and everything because he was in love with Mount Etna and that's why he moved there. So, you know, people were very sort of kind of suspicious of him at first, but as time has gone by, he's been really accepted by the community there, both by winemakers that moved from other places and by the like the local community. Um, and he's really passionate about Etna and he's really trying to like, you know, not just build his own name he really wants to build the, the Aetna reputation at the DOC so um but because he's been so successful and he's sort of you know internationally famous it's helped raise the awareness of Mount Aetna and everybody else there and because like he's working totally naturally and working naturally you know like like quasi biodynamically in the vineyards and Salvo Foti is organic and all the people that he's trained are organic and like traditional farming on Mount Etna is organic and stuff like that. Etna, natural winemaking and organic farming, it's, it's not that there isn't other conventional winemaking on Mount Etna, there absolutely is. Like while I was there, Vincenzo, we pulled, we were driving around, he was showing me vineyards and we pulled over to the side of the road and he was like, oh, look at that over there. That's Planeta, the huge company Planeta like with an excavator taking out terraces and using bulldozers to try and artificially make a flat vineyard so that they can plant like a normal vineyard with normal rows and use a tractor and stuff like that and do do like mechanical work here you know so like there is conventional winemaking on Mount Etna but natural winemaking like natural traditional farming like farming working by hand and natural winemaking is mainstream on Mount Etna. So many people are doing it and so many people have been successful at it. And it's been such a huge piece of Etna's success in the international marketplace that, um, that natural winemaking is like normal. Like people, at this point, people aren't skeptical of it or anything. Like people are, it's, it's almost like, it's almost the default for like new winemakers coming into Mount Etna because so many consumers expect that. Um, and that's, an, that to me, that's another thing that sort of sets Mount Etna apart that makes Mount Etna kind of unique, um, that Mount Etna to a great extent has been, it's, it's a wine region. It's a famous international wine region that to a great extent has been defined by natural winemakers. Um, it also helps that it, or, you know, also, um, adjacent to that Mount Etna is, a emerging wine region. It's a wine region that's been there for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Um, but uh, because there was that that pre that post war gap in serious winemaking, Mount Etna is re emerging and redefining what Mount Etna wine is. Um, and consumers are still figuring that out. Like people are aware of Mount Etna, they're excited about Mount Etna, but it's not like left bank Bordeaux 
or right bank Bordeaux or like, or champagne where like you say champagne to somebody and everybody is like, Oh, Vu Clico yellow label. And they immediately have this idea of what champagne is. You say Mount Etna wine to people and they're like, Oh, that's a volcano, right? The wine making wine on top of a volcano. That must be really interesting. But, you know, and so they're like, they're interested in it, but they're not like, oh, wine from Mount Etna. I know, I know that I know exactly what Mount Etna wine tastes like and stuff, you know, and and that's really nice that people don't walk into it with like a whole loaded set of preconceptions. Um, Let's see, I've talked about the Contrada system. Um, The only other thing I really want to say that I, I think that I've forgotten to say so far is, um, oh, the only other thing I really wanna say that I've forgotten to say so far is if I can find the picture, Sicily 2019. Uh, the north side of Mount Etna, how that is different from the rest of Mount Etna. All right, cool. Here we go. Um, so you have Mount Etna over here. And I need to move that. Mount Etna. And you have the Etna DOC all around here. Um, but the East Coast gets so much moisture and wind and stuff off of the Ionian Sea that there isn't a lot of red wine production here. And Southern Mount Etna, there's wine production, but honestly, I don't know if I've ever actually tasted a wine from the Southern Slope of Mount Etna. In all of the Etna wine drinking that I've done, I don't think, I don't think I've ever run into a wine from over here. All the wines that I've drunk have come from the East Coast or the North, Northeast Slope over here because down here, like this is pretty flat. Um, And so you still get a lot of influence off of the ocean here. Uh, The Northeast side of Mount Etna, as you can tell from these rivers over here, you have the Nebrodi mountain range right here. And then the uh, Pelotani mountains up here, which they're basically, it's one contiguous mountain range right along here. Um, So you have Mount Etna, blocking weather coming up from the south and you have this mountain range blocking weather coming down from the north the only way that like uh, weather systems that storms get to the vineyards on the north side of Mount Etna they come in off the Ionian Sea and then they get funneled up this valley the Alcantara River Valley to the vineyards and that shelters the vineyards from storms off of the sea and keeps them from getting like getting too much moisture um that you know so those those vineyards on the north slope are um are drier and sunnier and protected and everything because of that so like pretty much as far as i know and as far as i've experienced all the really serious winemaking on mount etna like serious fine red wine is coming from that north northeast slope running from like lingua losa uh in the east over to rondazzo in the the left um and uh yeah just like the nebrodi mountains that mountain range across the alcantara river are almost as important as mount etna to influencing those wines that are coming from the north slope of Mount Etna. And um, at this point, I think I've covered a lot. Um, and I think that's every, <laughs> I think that's everything that is like really important about, about Mount Etna. But uh, do I have it here? I've got pictures of the Nebrodi Mountains. Ah, do I not have them on this computer? I don't. Um, I went and I ran. It was after I visited Simone uh, here at Salvo Foti. I went, oh, there it is. There's, there's one. I have one picture. So after I visited Simone and Salvo Foti's winery, I drove on to Rondazzo and I had like a late lunch there. And then I finished, I had like a, you know, like two hour lunch 
drank a whole bunch of wines from Mount Etna, ate like multiple pasta courses, and went out and was walking, walking around. And from Rondazzo, you look right across the Alcantara River Valley at the Nebrodi Mountains here. And so I was like, and I saw, and I saw this road right there, that switchback road going up through the mountains. And I was like, I have to go run that road right now. And so like, I, it was dusk and it had been raining and I got in the car and just stripped off all my clothes, changed into running clothes, got out of the car, parked in front, I was, I was parked in front of some like, you know, vol black volcanic bas basalt rock church and ran all the way down here, down the slopes to the Alcantara River. And then I ran all the way up those switchbacks up over those mountains, over like up into the Nebrodi mountain range <laughs> and then turned around and ran back. And it was like, it was like a good hour and a half long, you know, like 10 mile run up through the, the Nebrodi mountain range. But it was really cool to like get up into the Nebrodi mountains and look back at Mount Etna and see like the Ionian Sea over there and stuff like that. And like feel how cold and windy it was up there in the Nebrodi range on the other, uh, the other side. So that's it. I think that's everything. Um, Thank you for paying attention to me for two goddamn hours. Um, next week, I'm going to do Beaujolais. I'm excited. Um, I know who's going to be there. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have I'm going I'm going to have a whole bunch of different crazy crew Beaujolais and like different like intense, brilliant, beautiful gamets from crazy volcanic and granite and everything. And then the week after that, I'm going to do Nebbiolo and I'm going to do a bunch of Barolo and Barbaresco and Roero and Nebbiola de Longue and stuff like that. So um, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for watching. Uh, have a great evening and um, I'll see y'all later. Bye. Thank you, Ned. It's five o'clock. My stupid computer does that. <laughs> thanks, Ned. <laughs>